You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hello, friends, clever listeners. For the next few weeks, we're taking you on a little trip down memory lane. Clever launched in 2016, and since then, we've met so many talented folks and shared their fascinating personal stories that we thought we'd revisit a few of them. So we handpicked a selection of some of our favorites that are definitely worth a second listen. And if you miss them the first time, you are in for a real treat. We'll be back in September with some exciting and shiny new episodes for you. In the meantime, I hope you'll take us with you in your ears and in your hearts on all your summer adventures. I want to be with you on your bike rides, on your road trip, and lounging with you in a hammock. Okay, so we love and appreciate you a ton, and please do stay in touch on social. See you soon. Hi, everyone. I'm Jamie Derringer. I'm Amy Devers, and this is Clever. Today, we're celebrating our 100th episode. Woo! That's right, with an awesome guest. I know. Cheers. We have an awesome guest, the one and only Bobby Burke. That's right, Bobby Burke from Queer Eye, the award-winning, heartstrings-pulling Netflix series. We had the luxury of meeting up with him in his home for this talk because he and Jamie have been friends for a long time. And while his interior design skills are undeniable and very evident in the makeovers he pulls off for the show, his real creative talent lies in the way he's designed his life. Born and raised in the South in a religious home, he always felt like an outsider. So perhaps looking at the world from that perspective helped him see openings and opportunities. He tells us he's always had an entrepreneurial streak a mile wide and shares how he put that to work, often in growing his brand, but in the early days mostly for survival, like when he had to couch surf or live in his car. But don't worry, he's obviously doing a lot better now. So let's talk to Bobby. My name's Bobby Burke. I live and work in LA and I own a design firm and I'm also on Queer Eye. I do what I do because it's fun. Is there any deeper motivation? I mean, money. I mean, that's always everyone's motivation. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I appreciate the honesty. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It's always great to enjoy what you do and also be successful at it. So, yeah. We'll start at the very beginning. So you grew up in the South. (laughs) um, In Missouri. Uh, Why don't you tell us a little bit about little Bobby growing up in the South? What was your family like? Um, I grew up in a really small town. I went to a one room school, kind of little house on the prairie esque, but dirt dirt floor? Or did you? No, not quite. (laughs) We weren't that hillbilly. (laughs) Um, uh, No, it was a private Christian school, and it was one of those. It was called AC. It was called an ACE school, which stood for Accelerated Christian Education. Um, and we had our own workbooks that were called paces and we all had our own little cubicles that faced the wall and we would work at our own pace. So when I left in the sixth grade, I was already doing eighth grade work, which if you always an overachiever, yeah, if you were an overachiever, it was great. If you were an underachiever, not so great. Mm-hmm. Cause you know, you would be doing, there were some kids that were doing work, you know, if they were in sixth grade, they were doing fourth grade work. So it was weird. Like you had your own little cubicle facing the wall. The principal, she was an actual accredited teacher, but the other teachers were just like volunteers. So if you needed to use the bathroom or you needed to read um, out loud, you would put up your American flag at the top of your cubicle. But if you had like a real educational question, you put up your Christian flag and then the principal, which she'd come over and help you. Yeah. It was interesting. Um, needless to say, sixth grade, it begged my parents to let me go to middle school at a public school. And finally they conceded. Did they put you in this Christian private school because of proximity or because of beliefs? Um, beliefs. Yeah. Okay. Not proximity. No, okay. No, it would have been much easier for us to be on a public school bus. Did they let you go to the public middle school? Yeah, they finally did, which then pulled my sister out of the private school as well and put her in public school, which she started her junior year in high school in public school, which was a big shocker for her because she had been in that little school of less than 20 people, her whole school. Oh, yeah. Wow. And she's a, she was a shy person as it was. So it wasn't the best thing for her, mm-hmm. um, but for me, I liked it. Okay. Yeah. And what was your relationship with your parents growing up? Like, what was the family dynamic like? Um, I mean, typical Christian family. My mother definitely was very much a control freak and liked things done a certain way. Mm-hmm. Um, very overprotective. But yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, she was a good mom. 
Okay. Yeah. Your dad was the breadwinner? Um, yeah. My dad um, worked for a trucking company, owned his own trucks at some point. And so he was gone a lot, especially when I was little. Okay. Um, it wasn't until probably like seven or eight that he was home more on a consistent basis. So yeah, when we were little, my mom was basically a single mom. He would be gone for weeks at a time sometimes, living in the middle of Missouri with two young kids on a farm with tons of animals, you know, moved her from big city Houston, Texas out into the middle of nowhere in Missouri. Wow. So, it sounds kind of scrappy actually. Yeah. So public school, middle high public school, right? Did they, things open up for you there or were you still kind of feeling um, like culturally, where were you feeling situated? Not there. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, you know, it was still very small town, very religious, very country, very small minded. And you never felt like that was your people? No, no, no. I never fit in there. I mean, I, I, didn't like stick out like a sore thumb. I was kind of just like, I've friends with this group and friends with that group, but I never really had a group that I was a part of. Mm -hmm. I was always kind of on the outsides of every group. Um, by the, especially in a small town, by the time you get to junior high, like everyone went to school with each other from kindergarten. So everyone There's knew so each familiarity. other. Familiarity. Yeah. yeah. So the people that were friends with each other we're friends with each other already that the cliques had formed, you know, the lifelong friendships were there. And then I was this new kid. So again, I was kind of friends with everybody, but not, not really friends. And my mother being as overprotective as she was, if she didn't know the family, if she didn't know the parents, she didn't know everything about them. I was never allowed to go to their house. So I think I had to sleep over once as a child. Oh, yeah. that sounds a little isolating. Yeah, actually. it was. But you, I mean, you have great social skills. Did you feel awkward then or did you oh, feel like... Oh, I still like, feel awkward. Oh, oh honey. <laughs> oh, <laughs> God, yeah. Hug after this. Uh, nothing, nothing makes me more anxious than having to go to a party. Really? Yeah. Oh, I, it's almost a relief to hear that because yeah. I kind of feel the same way and I'm like, I can put on a good, you know, face. Oh, so can I. Yeah, I can party with the best yeah. of them, but man, is it exhausting. But will you find me sometimes in the bathroom sitting on the toilet when I don't need to go? Just like <laughs> playing on my phone? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what happened after junior high? I mean, I, I read that you had some teenage years that were maybe turbulent and Yeah, you know, I definitely kind of took matters into your own hands. I wasn't a bad kid, but I was definitely a, a strong willed kid. Mm -hmm. Just strong willed of, oh hey, I'm fifteen and my bedtime's till eight thirty. Hey, I'd I'd like to at least, you know, hang out after church with my youth group. Wasn't allowed to. You know, so compared to my sister who was just fine with like staying home with mom and dad and riding her horses and you know, my mommy's my best friend, even though that's not, you know, line from Spice World. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't think your sister sounds like that. No, baby spice. <laughs> my mommy's my best friend. Um, you know, I just, I needed to get out in the world. And at that point I had figured out I was gay and I was wearing a mask every day. There was nobody in the world who knew who I was. And it made me a very angry person. It made me a very depressed person. Yeah. Um, and so that came, you know, my parents and I butted heads a lot. And, you know, I would always get that line, well, if you don't like our rules, there's the door. And then one night we got in a big fight and they said that and I'm all, bye. And, and I left. And on a foot? Back. On a horse? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, uh, I mean, it, it was a pretty heated argument that night and I got on the phone and I called a friend of mine to come get me. Okay. And then I, How old were you? 15. Yeah. I snuck out the window and climbed down the gutter and did you Very ever cliche. go back no. or that? Oh, where did no. you, where did you venture? Did you go off to seek your fortune? Um, yeah. <laughs> a pot of gold. <laughs> um, I lived in my car. I lived on friends' sofas. No, eventually I got an apartment, but then I realized I couldn't afford to live and eat and go to school. So that's when I dropped out of school beginning of my junior year. And you're still an angry masked youth, like trying to figure out where, um, at that point, no, at that point I came out. Like once I oh, left home, okay. I came out. Um, there wasn't anybody that came into my life at that point that didn't know, like I didn't really hide it from people either at work. When you came out and all of the people that you interfaced with thereafter knew mm -hmm. that you were out, did your parents know too? Or? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I had a friend that outed me oh, and so they knew. Okay. Yeah. And so there was a few years we didn't really speak. Okay. Yeah. That's rough. Yeah. But did you feel sort of liberated too in that you now oh, kind of were your own person and could yeah. go do your own thing? Yeah, I've always been very, my brain's fried. Where's my words? Very on my own. No, independent. independent. There we go. <laughs> Shit. 
<laughs> I want to know where your creativity started. Were you always a creative kid or did it come out later in life? Yeah. I mean, I remember even at like five, maybe like redoing my bedroom, changing the colors, bedspread and art. And yeah, it just was, my mom was crafty when I was little. Like she always sewed our own clothes and made our own cabbage patch dolls. You remember cabbage patch dolls? Mm -hmm. At the craft store, you could buy just the heads and she would make the bodies because the real ones were too expensive. Yeah. So she was always, she was always like fixing up the house and, you know, painting. And so I think I got it from her. What was your first introduction to design? I mean, yes, you're creative, you're, you know, redoing things, but it, what was your first introduction to design on, in the outside world? Your experience with that and understanding that it was design. I would say the first time would have been in Target, the Michael Graves collection. The first time I really looked at something and was like, huh, thought went into this. It's not just a tea kettle. Mm -hmm. It's not just for boiling water. It's something that makes, you know, as Marie would say, sparks joy when you look at it. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes you happy when you use it. And for the first time I've thought of things, it's not just utilitarian, but something that could make you happy as well as be functional, you know, and that good design could make them even more functional. So yeah, probably the Michael Graves collection at Target. Did you experience that um, in the South in your youth? Um, yeah, at Target, Missouri. Okay. Yeah. That's actually a pretty powerful testament to that whole... That's why I'm on every major billboard for that campaign right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how did you decide to leave the South? What's that story? I think I was probably 17 and I was taking a friend to work one day and the road was blocked that we normally take. And so I went to cut through a hospital parking lot and every exit was blocked. And finally I like came to a screeching hold. I'm like, this is my life. I'm trying to just get somewhere and everything is blocked. Every exit is blocked. And I like remember just like screeching to a halt, opening up the car door and just like sprawling out <laughs> in the parking lot and just being like, you know, because I, I wasn't going anywhere with my life, but I, I just knew that wasn't okay. That wasn't enough. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I had no idea where I wanted to go. I just but knew that it was wasn't going to happen there. I needed to be somewhere that challenged me and pushed me and got me in a different direction. I knew one person in the world really outside of Missouri. And that was my friend, Jesse, who lives in Denver. And we had met on ICQ years before that. I don't know if you remember ICQ. I do. Uh -oh. <laughs> Uh oh, <laughs> that was a little sound it made when you had a message. And so I called him and I'm like, I've got to get out of Missouri, but I'm like, I don't know how. And he's like, come to Denver. I'm like, I can't, I don't have anywhere to live. I don't have money. I don't have a job. And he's like, I'll work on the place to live. You work on everything else. So he calls me back an hour later and he's like, all right, my college roommate has an extra bedroom. You can live there until you find a place. I'm like, okay, well, I still have no money. So I went to work and at the time I was working multiple jobs, one of them being a stock boy at the body shop. And I went in and I told my boss, I was like, I really want to move to Denver. I've got to get out of here. She's like, oh, all right, well, that's nice. You know, and then an hour later she comes out and she's like, all right, you're the assistant manager of the body shop at the Denver International Airport now. Okay. So I have an apartment, I have a job and I'm like, but I, I have like, I was broke paycheck to paycheck, you know, getting payday loans, like broke. Um, my rent was $400 a month and I had two roommates to afford it. And so I went home and I looked and I had a big DVD collection of DVDs that I had accumulated from friends and stuff. And so I went to Hastings Music, which is no longer, <laughs> and I sold them all and I made like 500 bucks and I used that to get a U-Haul and a trailer to tra haul my car and loaded up the truck and I moved to Denver. <laughs> <laughs> I never knew you moved yeah, to Denver. That, the breakdown in the parking lot and in the driver's seat of that U-Haul all happened within 24 hours. Oh, wow. I was like, I know if I do not do this now, I'll talk myself out of it. Um, I think that's how I've done a lot of things in my life. <laughs> I'm like, if I don't do this now, I'm going to talk myself out of it because this is a really stupid thing to do. Um, but I remember my friend Jesse took the Greyhound out to Missouri to ride with me to Denver. And I came up over the horizon on I-70 and saw Denver out there and was just like pulled over on the side of the road and started crying. I was like, I have made the biggest mistake. This city is huge. I'm never going to be able to make it here. What was I thinking? And then fast forward three years later, I'm like, this city is so small. I've got to get out of here. I got to go to New York. What was I thinking? Yeah. Um, but Denver was a great little stepping stone. You know, I definitely 
came into my own in Denver. You know, I got my party days out of the way at a young age, you know, my fake IDs, you know, the after all that, you know, mm-hmm. by the time I got to New York, I had kind of worked all that out of my system and you know, I was ready to focus on life. That's the next chapter. Tell us that one. So how, how did you make the move to New York and what were you ready to focus on? I had went out there to visit a friend. And I met somebody and it was funny. I had been talking to this guy online, I think gay.com probably. And we had been chatting, nothing, nothing big, just randomly chatting. And I went to visit a friend and I went to a club in New York and I was walking through this club and somebody ran into me and like spilt their drink all over me. And I looked up and it was the guy I had been talking to online. Get out. Like, yeah, had no plans to meet nothing. I was like, Tim, he's like, Bobby, like, fell madly in love, like super <laughs> passionate, super quick. So I decided to move to New York to be with him. What and year was this for context? This was 2003. Okay. Um, 2002, 2003. And so, cause I moved to New York June 23rd, 2003. Planned on moving out there to be with him. That relationship ended before I ever moved. But I, at that point had fallen in love with the city mm-hmm. and I realized that that's where I needed to be. So I decided to come to New York anyways. I had probably like... A hundred bucks left to spend. I had saved up three months rent and I had a hundred bucks left after that. So I had gotten a sublet to this guy's apartment who was going to Israel for three months. It was a two bedroom. He was wanting one bedroom to me, one bedroom to another guy. I got there and he's like, oh, there's a problem. The other guy flaked out. You're going to have to pay the whole rent. And I was like, well... I have enough to pay you three months rent of my half. If that's not enough for you, then I'm going to have to go couch surf. And he was leaving for Israel the next day. So he really had no choice. Mm -hmm. So I got a great two bedroom apartment for pennies. And I promptly went on Craigslist the next day and rented out the second bedroom. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, so this entrepreneurial thing. Oh, oh, you have no idea. Have you always been a hustler? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. There was, there's lots I left out before that, but we won't go there. That'll got to save that for the book. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> or maybe part two. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. yeah I've, after. I've always been an entrepreneur. Yeah. Legal or not. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So in New York, you mm-hmm. start working for different retail companies, um, right? I had planned on, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a plan. My plan right. was just get a job as a server because I had worked at restaurants at Applebee's and Italian restaurants in Denver and Missouri. I was like, I'll just get a job at a server and I'll, I'll figure it out. Nope. In New York, you need New York City experience to get a job as a server. So I was like, well, crap, you know. Um, so I went about three months without a job. And then I finally got a job as a design manager at Restoration Hardware in the Flatiron Building or next to the Flatiron Building. Mm-hmm. And that was my first job in New York. And I mean, I got fired while Tom Felicia was... Filming Queer Eye upstairs. No way. Yeah. How did you get fired? <laughs> um, the night before, we were getting the store ready and being the perfectionist I was, we were there way later than we were supposed to be, forgot to clock everybody out. Oh. The next day I went in and we were there till like one and they had clocked us out at eight. I went in and I saw that the general manager had clocked everyone out at eight, assuming that's when we left. So I was like, well, no, that's not right. So I went in and fixed everybody's time, including mine. Mm-hmm. Well, there was another manager who wanted my job. And so she went in and tattled that I had changed my own time, which was completely against the rules. I had actually oh. fired somebody the week before for doing it. And so the GM's like, I have to fire you. Okay. And it's funny, when I got cast on the show, she messaged me. She's like, aren't you glad I fired you? <laughs> and I was like, yes. Like, we kept in touch throughout the whole years. You know, it wasn't like a, you're awful, I'm firing you. It was a, oh, I have to, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And so her name is Callista, and her and I have kept in contact all these years. You just mentioned Queer Eye. So we've got to connect the dots from this job at Restoration Hardware mm-hmm. all the way up to Queer Eye. And I know there were other retail operations yeah. in there. So what can you tell us about your professional so tra- tra- trajectory? after Queer Eye went to Bed Bath & Beyond. No, not after Queer Eye. Oh, after I'm sorry, Restoration. after Restoration Hardware. Okay. Yeah, after Restoration Hardware, I went to Bed Bath & Beyond. Worst job I've ever had. Used to cry walking to work. <laughs> Um, and then I started working for an Italian linen company. They were wanting to expand their business in the U S so they wanted to bring me in to help with, you know, all things American. And we butted heads from day one, you know, like for example, Americans like flat sheets. Hi, no, they don't like a flat sheet. It's a duvet cover and the faded sheet, you know, just things like that. 
they wouldn't listen to me on. So eventually they fired me, which I've been fired from every job I've ever had. Um, Chrissy Teigen and I, we wear it with a badge of pride, mm-hmm. been fired from every job we've ever had. Um, uh, they fired me, telling me I was worthless, would never amount to anything. So then that company was manufacturing for Portico. And so the owner of Portico, which had gotten to know me, he was like, come work for me, dude. Portico was a home store. Portico was a home store, um, a super cool high-end boutique. Like I remember when I first moved to New York, I'd peer through the window and be like, maybe I'll be able to afford to buy a towel there one day, you know? Um, But they also had a spa line, like shampoos, conditioners, and which was in every Hyatt hotel all across the U.S. So I started managing their Soho store, and then I worked my way up to buyer, and then eventually creative director of the company. Um, They had filed bankruptcy multiple times throughout the years. Uh, They were never really able to pull out of it. And so in 2005... Yeah, probably 2005, I was, they had filed bankruptcy. I was running the website from my apartment on the Upper East Side. I was the only employee left, but the owner had said, oh, if, if, if I get this out of bankruptcy, I'll make you a partner. And so I was keeping the company going I had fake employee names and emails, making mm-hmm. it looking like this, you know, and we, I had started selling Gus Modern on porticohome.com because Portico wasn't able to manufacture their own merchandise anymore. So I was bringing in other brands. And the intellectual property got sold in bankruptcy court. So I got a letter from the court, cease and desist, shut the website down. So I'm like, oh crap, what am I going to do? So I registered bobbyburkhome.com and I cloned the e-commerce site that I had built for Portico, including all of Gus's products. And I launched it on bobbyburkhome.com saying that maybe I'll sell a sofa or two while I look for another job. Um, I sold a few more than that. Uh, I remember though getting a email and letter from the owner of Gus uh, saying cease and desist, take our products off your website. We had a relationship with Portico, not Bobby Burke. You do not have permission to sell our product. And so I remember calling her and being like, hey, give me a chance. You know, your relationship was with me. I was the only employee there. (laughs) You just didn't realize it. Yeah. Um, And then like fast forward to like a year and a half later, we were their biggest U.S. retailer. Wow. Yeah. So... And anytime we butted heads throughout the years, I'd be like, wait a minute, remember when you didn't want to sell to me? And now I, you know, I paid for a couple of vacation homes, you know, <laughs> give me, <laughs> give me my way. And and I mean, so you opened up retail. At that so point. yeah, the, the website started doing really well. And back then there was no one else. There was Velocity Art and Design out of mm-hmm. Seattle, John. Um, I know he was the first one to go, sadly. Oh. Um, and I think it was just... It was Velocity, me, and either Too Modern or Design Public. Modern, <clears throat> I think it was Too Modern was the local. original, and then Design Public came onto the market. And so back then there was, A, there, you really couldn't buy furniture online. B, you definitely couldn't buy modern furniture online. And my biggest hurdle back then was getting companies to sell to me because if you weren't brick and mortar, they wouldn't sell to you. It was such a new thing to mm-hmm. sell things online. Mm-hmm. Manufacturers didn't want to upset their brick and mortar retailers by selling their products online. So they just say, no, 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 no. So Gus was my very first that I was able to get on there. And then, you know, I'd go to high point, I'd try to get manufacturers to sell to me and nobody would, and nobody would. So finally I get a call one day from the Italians and they're like, hey, you know, we see you have your own brand now and it's doing well. And we have a store in Soho and it's not doing well. Um, do you want to buy me out? And so I was like, wait a second. I thought it was worthless and I'd never amount to anything. But yes. Um, <laughs> so they had about $600,000 in debt, which I mean, back then it might have well been $60 million to me now. Mm-hmm. Like that was a massive amount of money. But they offered to let me buy half the company for fifty grand plus all the debt. Mm. And so all of my friends in finance were like, no, 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 no. That's the stupidest decision mm. as a, what are you thinking? It's not working for them. Why do you think it's going to work for you? And you'd be able to pay off the debt. But I looked at it as a huge opportunity. I mean, brands work decades to have a store in Soho. Like once you're in Soho, you are legit, you are a brand. And I'm like, if I can make this work, I can skip decades of hard work by instantly, my brand is legit. It's in Soho, New York. Mm-hmm. So I took it on. I initially turned it into a sample sale location for Italian bedding. I called all their suppliers that they owed all this money to. And I'm like, hey, if you send me more product, I will pay you back. Um, and I paid off all the debt within nine months. And then they started s- siphoning money out of the company once money was coming in. <laughs> And I had to have a little talk with them and about the massive amount of tax debt that they had and massive amount of loans, 9-11 loans that they had taken that they never paid. And 
reminded them that if they just didn't sign the rest of the company over to me, that they might get caught in immigration the next time they came back through the country. Because they were just literally robbing me blind at that point. Like oh, I had, really? Yeah, I had, I had paid all their debt off. Um, and any profits that were coming into the company, they were just siphoning out from Italy. Never heard from them again. Still haven't. No. Um, so then I turned the store into a Bobby Burke home. And I mean, I think months later I met Jamie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you opened other, other locations. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, this, this chick with this website came in <laughs> and was like, I want to throw a party in your store. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. Okay. You seem cool. Sure. Um, yeah, we, it was for ICFF, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. The, the very first one. Yeah. We did a few for a few years we in a row. We did a couple of exhibitions yeah, and East meets West and, parties yeah. and super fun. Yeah. Um, then I opened up Miami and then Atlanta and then LA and the brand started getting awareness. And that was always the plan with the stores. Like I never wanted to be in retail, having worked retail for years. Like that was not my goal. It's really hard. It's yeah. Hard and especially when you're not huge as the owner, you have to deal with everything. And mm. when you have a manager that quits, you know, you're on a plane, mm. you know, like I was 2014, I was in Miami 90% of the year because I couldn't find a good manager and it was just horrible turnover. And then while I was in Miami dealing with that, I was getting calls from LA that my manager there had passed out drunk in the office. Like, yeah. And so it just, it was a lot, but the plan was brand awareness, get the brand out there. Um, let people know who I am, what I'm about so I could uh, start attracting licensed partners Mm -hmm. and it worked. I started becoming known as an authority in design and for especially millennial design. And though I wasn't an interior designer, you know, would help design people's homes, my, my customers, but no design background, no education in it. And so uh, around 2015, I decided license deals were happening. Leases were starting to be up. Rents, you know, my rent in Soho was going up to $72,000 a month. Um, And I already worked for my landlord, I felt, at $35,000 a month. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm like, all right, I need to rethink this business. I need to start going into product design, licensing more. My husband and I decided that we wanted to move to L.A. We were done with New York. Uh, and so I first closed, uh, first closed Atlanta. Yeah. Atlanta, we went in way too soon. Atlanta, I had a CFO that was working for me. He talked me into opening up Atlanta store. Remember in the end, he talked me into opening up Atlanta store and moving the corporate offices down there. So I sit and wouldn't see how much money he was yanking out of the company. So he went to jail I kept that store for like a year or two more. Just the neighborhood we were in in Midtown Atlanta. Did you have now. to prosecute him and send him to jail? Um, yeah. Yeah. But in Georgia, like you can pretty much get away with anything. So he's got community service. Got a felony on his record, though. But community wow, service. Yeah. Um, yeah, we went into Midtown Don't Atlanta. It was a beautiful 9,000 square foot, two story store. It was gorgeous. But it was too soon. Like if we went there now, it would have been done great. Like even CB2 was on our block and they closed their store too. Um, so Atlanta and then I closed LA cause I could not find a good manager out there. The one I thought was amazing ended up passing out drunk in the stock room. Um, and then I had Miami and New York and then I had Miami flooded twice. <laughs> and the second time it happened, it was, a uh, apartments above. I was like, you know what? <sighs> Screw this. And then New York, I'm like, why am I holding on to one? And so when the lease was up, I closed that as well. But right as I was deciding to close the stores, I got a call from Builder Magazine and they were like, hey, we are managing the show homes for the International Builder Show this year. And it's two show homes that are going to focus on what millennials want and what we need to change in the marketplace to attract millennials for mass home builders. Would you like to design the houses? Um, We hired Catch and PR to tell us who was the most millennial known, known designer in the millennial world. And they said you. And in my mind, I'm like, I'm not a designer. Like, (laughs) they messed up. But I go, sure, absolutely, I'll do that. I had no idea what I was doing. So I didn't know CAD, anything. So I got on YouTube and Google and, like, did all the plans in Photoshop, (laughs) you know, (laughs) figured out how to do electrical plans and cabinet layouts and figured it out. You and know? was that part fun or kind of sweaty and tedious? Both. Or, okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, because it was something that I was very passionate about that I always wanted to do. I just didn't think I could. Like, I didn't think without that, that education, it was an option for me. So in the middle of that, we moved to L.A. So we moved to L.A. in September 2015. 
and those hall the halls those houses were installing i i got to la i hired one good assistant adam and uh, you know luckily he knew cad um which is why i hired him he had a design degree and so him and i finished those houses together and installed them and they went really well and so the builder that built them party which is owned by tripoint group um which is barry who's the starwood barry diller um, the billionaire that started starwood capital and mm-hmm. starwood hotels and w and all that he's a main investor in them and they started hiring me to do all their model apartments our model homes and clubhouses and i mean fast forward years later they do so well that miss jamie derringer bought one you know <laughs> I heard that. It's true. <laughs> um, so that's how I started my design business. Do you feel like that first model home? I mean, obviously you were a retailer, you were mm-hmm. developing your design eye, you were very much um, a tastemaker yeah. in the space. But those first model homes is what legitimized you as like, oh, absolutely. now I'm working with the raw materials, I'm working with space, I'm designing yeah. with light, and I'm working with, yeah. you know, all of the nuts and bolts that need to go into a building. Yep. And at that point, then you probably are also shedding any self consciousness you might have about not having a formal education. Um, you're no. Sort of like I can figure it out. Or I mean, I've always been the type of person I just I can figure it out. Yeah. Um, yes and no. I mean, I still still to this day, you know, there's always some insecurities in your craft. I feel at least for me, but you know, I think that's what keeps me humble. Is if I thought I could do it all, know it all. Well, it turned into a monster. That would also make you a terrible creative person because yeah. you wouldn't have any, you know, new, great new ideas. Yeah. You know, I've in my company, both in my retail company and my design company, I've always made sure that I've hired people that are smarter than me. You know, maybe not smart as in, you know, being able to make it work like I do, but mm-hmm. people that know more in the areas that I don't, mm-hmm. you know, like with Adam, Adam's great. He, um, he had the design education that I didn't, he was able to take my ideas and design and put them into the way they were supposed to be. Um, and yeah, in my retail company, hiring people that knew how to manage stores better than me. And you know. so that brings me to your creative process because it, I'm starting to get the picture that your creative process is really about how you bring in the moving parts together and yeah. make it work. Um, it's, and I'm sure you have an eye that's, that's a crucial part of it, yeah. but it's also about like the underpinnings of like, well, I need somebody to be able to manage this aspect of it. So yeah. I don't have to, and I am also going to need to have this happen in this sequence of, or, you know, can, like break down your creative it's, process. For it's me. been the same with queer eye as well, because especially for season one and two, like nobody knew if the show was going to be successful. You know, we definitely, we thought it wasn't going to, we're like, Oh, this will be a cute little six months out of our lives. And then we'll just go back to our regular lives. Um, so there wasn't a big budget. There wasn't a big team. So I was basically the executive producer, even though by title, which you will notice there are no Emmys here, (laughs) even though we've gotten seven, because if you're not an executive (laughs) producer, you don't get one. (laughs) But you know, we all had to go in there and kind of make it work. And it wasn't like I was just talent on a show. I was actually in there like figuring out how are we going to do these homes in a week? And Mm -hmm. luckily enough, I had an amazing art director, Tommy, who, uh, worked on extreme home makeover and he's doing the new season as we speak right now. And I was able to learn a lot from him as well. And, you know, he was again, one of those people that was able to take my design and how I wanted it and teach me how to implement it in three days, you know, and the planning that had to go into that. So design isn't just about having an eye. It's about how you can pull all that together, you know, cause you can have an eye all you want. And if you don't know how to make something work. Right. It's, it's, it's having yeah. not enough knowledge and enough figure it outable capacity to execute yeah. on that vision, which is yeah. the really tough part. Yeah. That's why I'm not a designer. <laughs> I, I yeah. can spot the trends, but I couldn't put them together for shit. You know, and it's great now because I have such an amazing team. I always look at myself more as like the big picture person. You know what? I'm the forest. I need you to be the trees. Mm. Um, and I have such an amazing team now I can, with the craziness of my life and being gone six to 10 months out of the year, I can have those big picture ideas and I have the team that can really knock them out of the park now. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. What's so, so then part of your creative process is about relationships. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And the, from day one, you know, that's how I was able to make my online business successful is I made people want to do business with me, mm-hmm. not my company. To me, it's 
always been about relationship. It's always been about the way you treat people, you know, because nobody wanted to give some little online company a chance, Mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, then they wanted to give me a chance, you know, so relationships and the way they work together is very important. Where did that come from? I mean, I'm trying to pick it up from your youth. It doesn't sound like. No, I mean, I barely had interaction with anybody in my youth. (laughs) Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. You think it was just encoded into your DNA? So. You arrived yeah. here with Not it? Not maybe like a need to have those relationships because you didn't have them before? Probably. I mean, yeah, I'm sure it's, a, yeah, I'm sure there's all those reasons. I don't know. I don't know if I, I, don't know if I want to go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> 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 Ignorance is bliss. All of a sudden the headline is Bobby Burke has a breakdown and it's a clever bad co- podcast <laughs> made himself reflect and he imploded. We're basically oh. like Barbara Walters over here. And well. this is clever podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, honestly, I do think um, if you did crack yourself open and look hardcore at the granular details of yourself, you'd probably be pretty impressed. Thank you. I want to go back to what you were talking about with Queer Eye. Like you didn't know it was going to get off the Mm -hmm. ground. You had no idea it would be the sensation that it has been or has become. So like when you first got it, what were you feeling? I know you had tried to do TV and shows for a long time. Yeah. Were you scared? What were you feeling when Um, you got the show? I just assumed I wouldn't get it. You know, I had worked with a couple of production companies and networks before I didn't want to do TV to be on TV. I wanted to be on TV for brand awareness, to expand the brand. You know, like the stores were always a catalyst to license and eventually sell the company and sell the brand and the brand to have value. Um, So being on TV was a catalyst for that as well. I wanted to make the brand a star, but as since the brand was my name, then turned, it happened with me as well. But yeah, by the time... You know, I got the opportunity to audition for Queer Eye. I had been through so many like networks coming to me going, oh, we want to do shows about you and none of it ever panning out to where I'm just like, all right, yeah, sure. Whatever, Queer Eye, I'm not going to get this. You know, sure. I'll do your little Skype interview. And yeah, that didn't go well. And you were with me, actually. We were in um, Palm Springs setting up the social house. Yes. When we got the call that they wanted me to come in for in-person, like final, like the top 40 out of 3000 people auditions. And still I was like, ah, I mean, this is cool, but I'm like, oh, there's no <laughs> yeah, way I'm going to get this. You never really yeah. can and then get your hopes up. The week of auditions, I was actually supposed to go to Spain with Porcelanosa. They were taking me over and I was like, uh, I really want to go to Spain. I'm like, <laughs> I'm not going to get this. I'm going to pass up this amazing trip for this audition and I'm not going to get it. Um, so luckily I wasn't supposed to go to Spain until that Friday and audition started on Wednesday and then Thursday. And I had let, um, I think I was with you because I remember you talking about this or you, I don't uh, Yeah. Like, I mean, oh, we I don't know if I want to go, like, I yeah. don't know what to do. Yeah. Cause we were in Palm Springs. Yeah. That whole week dealing with modernism week in the social house. Oh, yeah. It was yeah. all that same week. Yeah. It was all that same week. Yeah. And so uh, I had let Porcelain also know, I was like, you know, I have an audition for a show and they're like, you know what, do whatever you need to do. They're such an amazing company. Everyone that works for them is just the most wonderful person, one of the wonderful people. Late Thursday night, I still hadn't got a call back. And so I'm like, crap, you know, I need to tell Porcelain Oza. And finally at like 1231 in the morning, I finally get a call from the creator of the show saying, hey, we want you to come back tomorrow. Um, and then he's like, without giving anything away, you're our top choice. And I was like, And that was actually the first, that was actually when I kind of had my like, holy fuck. This could happen. This could happen. Like even when I got the show, I was like, great, I got the show. Cause at that point we were just so emotionally drained from the audition process. But like that night was when I was like, what? And then I got to the auditions the next day and they had the top 40 ish was like four to six people in each category. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I got there the next day. And everybody but one person in my category was still there. So I was like, wait a minute, what the hell? I thought they said I was like their number one choice. And so that like messed with my head. But yeah, in the end, got it. Did you have any fears about it? Or were you Um, just like, I'm just going to go with the flow and see what happens? It's kind of just, I'm going to go with the flow and see what happens. You know, I knew one of the, there were a couple of show opportunities before that could have happened, but I actually passed on because I had seen so many reality shows ruin people's brands. Um, Like my friend Calvin was on the fashion show and he's this catty, bitchy, funny guy um, who's always making snide comments like, bitch, you send the same shit down the runway every week, but I love it. 
they, you know, they would edit the, but I love it. Mm. And they would make him, they made him look like a monster. And he had four very successful clothing stores before that. And after they all closed because people were like, I'm not buying from that asshole. So I was always very aware that I have a brand and if I'm only doing this to better the brand, but if my brand is in the hand of a producer who only cares about ratings, what could happen to right. that brand? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then ruined my brand. Um, and so there was a, a couple networks who wanted to do reality shows about my company. And I'm like, no, I'm like, give me executive producer role. And they're like, no, who are you? <laughs> um, and so I'm like, well, I'm not, I'm not putting my brand in the hands of somebody who doesn't ultimately care about my brand. They just care about ratings. Um, so by the time I got to Queer Eye, like I knew that Queer Eye, the whole premise, especially the, the original show was to make them look like gay superheroes. Mm -hmm. You know, there was, even if something stupid had happened, it would never make the cut because the whole premise of the show was these guys are coming in to help you. They're never going to make the Fab Five look bad. So I'm like, you know what? I felt comfortable putting my brand in the hands of, of Netflix and of our showrunner, Jen Lane, because I knew that their only, their only purpose was to make us look good. Yeah. Um, and luckily we're a part of a show that we're able to, to look good on our own. You know, we're able to do positive, good things. It's right. not a, it's not a catty show. It's not a rip you apart kind of show. It's not a negativity show. It's, it's a loving show. You yeah. Know? There's no competition in the show. Right. You're not like pitted against right. anybody else or anything like that. And right. it's not mean spirited in terms of making right. some people look dumb or unfashionable. Right. Um, I mean, one of the things that you might have in a concern with as when they're rebooting something that was so successful in the original form is, are they going to try and recapture this success by just, you know, making the same lasagna they've made? And, and originally that's kind of what it was. So there was, there was definitely some fights going on behind the scenes. Um, there were the executive producers and creators of the original show who kind of had it in their mind that it was going to be pretty much the same show. And that's not a negative comment towards them. It's, mm -hmm. they had a very successful recipe, mm -hmm. um, and a very successful show. And they're like, well, why wouldn't we do it this way? It, it worked. But our executive producer, Jennifer, Jen Lane, the showrunner knew that the recipe needed to change. It needed to be modernized. She knew that the cattiness of the original show of these five, you know, over the top gay guys going in and just picking this poor straight guy apart and telling him how he dresses horribly and his house is a mess and he can't cook and he stinks, you know, that wasn't going to work. We realized episode one, Tom Jackson, um, the very first episode we ever filmed season one and two, we've seen filmed together and they were all mixed in together. So the only one that was actually shown in the true order of when we shot it was the very first episode. And that was the episode, uh, even then, our, we hadn't planned on, our, planned on our show being like the love fest that it is. That was, mm -hmm. that was not planned. But we all instantly saw that when we showed this man a little bit of love. Yes. <laughs> oh, no. Are you going to um, cry? <laughs> When we showed this poor guy who was so lonely and so sad and had never really been shown the attention. And when five guys just came in and devoted every single ounce of their love and stop attention crying. to him. <laughs> no, don't stop. It's we fine. saw that in three humanity. days, this person was a different man mm -hmm. just because he was shown love and acceptance yes. by people that he would never have thought of getting it from. Mm -hmm. We were like, fuck. Like, Absolutely. this that's is where the power is. That is where the power is. And that's where the power is for the viewer, too, yeah. because we get to see that arc of human connection and we get to see the value of it. Yeah. And it enriches us <laughs> at home. <laughs> so by the time we got to episode two, which was which was Corey, the cop, yeah. the five of us, are kind of, I don't even know if we had really consciously had a conversation about it, but we we felt it and we were like whoa this was this was not what we signed up for yeah. right we did not come in here to be emotionally destroyed every week <laughs> we came in here to be these five catty gay guys that were going right. to tell you how you were doing everything wrong but we were like no that is not how we need to go about this we need to go in here and we need to find everything good and amazing about them that they just cannot see about themselves and show them and so by the time we got to Corey, there was still power struggles going on in the background between our showrunner and the creators. 
our ambush, like dossier is when we're in the car. Ambush is when we meet them. And de-straightening is when we're like supposed to be going through their house and like finding everything. We're in the house and we're like politely going through things because in my mind, I'm like, I'm not going to go through someone's home and rip it apart. I'm not going to go in here and be like, this is ugly when this man's wife poured her heart and soul into making this a home, Mm -hmm. whether it be my taste or not, whether I loved all the scriptures and crosses on the wall, I'm not going to disrespect it. But the creator of the show was like, no, like I remember us standing in the garage yelling and screaming at us that bigger, it needs to be more. You need to be ripping things apart. You need to be saying how awful they are. And we're just like, no, yeah, like we will not, we will not do this. We will try to be more over the top, but this is not the vision that we see. Like we proved last week what the formula for this show needs to be. It was definitely a fight for a few more episodes, but then I think he finally, after seeing every episode of how the heart and soul was becoming the heart and soul of the show, he realized there is another way of doing this that can be just as successful um, and and better at the end of the day. You know, not to say that our version is better than the original. The original had its time and its place, and that was that was the show that was needed at the time because people were not okay with gay people. They were not okay with seeing them on TV. But if they were, you know, the typical hairdresser and cook and decorator, oh, okay, we can wrap our heads around that. You know, because that's that's the... um, That was the culturally sort of palatable stereotype that people could digest easily. But I think what's so powerful about the current version is that it probably couldn't have happened without that original version at that point in time. So... Mm -hmm. It's sort of like a long-term relationship when you can build trust with somebody and know them even better, you're allowed to evolve yeah. and change and become a deeper, yeah. more nuanced human being. So the success of that show, which was culturally appropriate for that time, would have felt juvenile today. Mm-hmm. But the fact that it had that as a foundation allowed for this tremendous growth and ev- yeah. evolution of this show. And what we got as a viewing public is uh, the show that we all needed right now. Yeah, You know, Carson came under fire one time because he made the comment that the original show was more groundbreaking than ours. People got all upset. Oh, you're being so, so mean and bitchy. Like, I can't believe you're just jealous. And I'm like, I came to his defense. I'm like, the original show was more groundbreaking than ours. There were no gay people on TV. There was Will and Grace. Will's not actually gay in person. Sean Hayes was not out at that time. There were, I, I think Ellen had maybe just come out. I, actually, I don't even think she was out yet. Um, there were no gay people, real live gay people out in the wild on television. So absolutely Queer Eye was more groundbreaking than us and set the stage for us and so many others, you know? I mean, just to follow on that groundbreaking metaphor, they took a vacant lot and broke ground and built yeah. a house. Yeah, we just remodeled it. You remodeled it or yeah. or tore it down and built a new one, yeah. but at the same time, you didn't break the ground right. there. Yeah, no, they did. It was yeah. yeah. Both, but I think the both of them add up to a power that's greater than yeah. them individually. Yep. Yeah. We have quite questions about your personal long-term relationship and if you want to tell us about that love story. Yeah. Sure. I don't know that story, no. right? About how you met <coughs> Dewey, but I know that you've been together um, for a long we time. we met online. I was living in New York. He was um, home here in LA for the summer. He had just finished dental school and decided that, oh, wait, I don't want to be a dentist. And so then he decided to go to med school. Um, And I guess he was just online, lining dates up for when he got to New York. (laughs) Um, And we exchanged numbers. I didn't really think anything of it. And then I got a text from him one day and we met up and hung out. And that was almost 16 years ago. 16 years ago. Like, how would you characterize your relationship? Partners in crime? Or is there, like, does he also complement your um, weak areas? Yeah. I mean, we've kind of evened out a little bit now. He's definitely taken on a lot of my traits, and I've taken on a lot of his, you know. (laughs) It's like when um, you start to look like your dog. (laughs) Um, In the beginning, it was definitely yin and yang. Like, he barely spoke. Like all my friends thought he was a snob because he just didn't speak, but he was just like debil- I think I've seen that yeah, debilitatingly yeah. shy back then. And he was in med school and residency and he was just, he didn't have bandwidth to focus on anything else. He's a very, very much an overachiever in school and in his profession. So yeah, the first few years it was just, you know, 
was just my little buddy that didn't really speak. And any free time he had from med school, he'd, you know, spend with me. And I think after a year together, we moved in with each other. Um, it, it was almost more of a real estate decision. You know, mm -hmm. it's so expensive in New York. We were poor. He had a great student housing. And so we moved in with each other. And the first few years were very rocky. You know, we broke up a few times. I dated other people. Um, but at the end of the day, like we always ended up coming back to each other. Like I remember there was one like six month period where we broke up and I was dating somebody else, but I still like spoke to him every single day. Like the pers new person I was dating, like it drove him nuts because Dewey would call and no matter what was going on, I'd answer. He's like, you ever going to stop talking to him? I'm like, probably not. <laughs> And that, that breakup happened because we were living on the Upper East Side in student housing, 93rd and 1st. You know, it was a long commute downtown. By the time I got home at night to walk the dog, you know, I didn't want to go back downtown and on the subway and I couldn't afford to take a cab and none of my friends would come up there. So I was just lonely as hell. You know, I was in my early twenties in a relationship, but with none of the benefits of the relationship, just yeah. all the restrictions because yeah. he was in med school and residency. So the few hours a day he was home, he was either passed out exhausted or his face was in a book. So I just, I got Lola <laughs> and I had my little dog and I'd watch TV all the time, but I just, I, you know, I was miserable. So I ended up leaving him and then I realized it wasn't him. It was just the Upper East Side and how miserable my life was. And we got back together, got rid of that apartment, moved downtown and been together ever since. Is there a stability? I mean, obviously a long-term relationship provides a sense yeah. of stability, but your life got really crazy the last couple of years. Has, yeah. has having such a long-term rock yeah, helped definitely. you navigate that? Yeah. I I think my life personally not changing at all, I think is a big, a big piece of that is him and having him in my life. And, you know, like all the friends I hang out with are still the friends I've had for 20 years. You know, I try to keep it. Cause you're same. a relationship guy. You, yeah. You build relationships. Yeah. Okay. So I have one sort of critical technical question about self-care because mm -hmm. when your life gets this crazy and your team grows exponentially and mm -hmm. your obligations start to mount and you're not in control of your mm -hmm. schedule entirely, how do you take care of yourself and none. make sure that you carve out time for solitude have and self-inquiry, self, <laughs> self -inquiry, Bobby? Yeah, I know. Our show is all about <laughs> self-love and self-care, but unfortunately none of us really get any right now. Um, Are you just like gritting your teeth and white knuckling it till you get to like yeah, a slower like, pace and, or you I burn have my five-year plan in mind and I'm just going to get there. Just going to get there. Yeah. Okay. Santa Barbara kids, you know, I'll be in the studio in LA three days a week. I'll have my pilot's license by then. I'll fly a helicopter down, fly back up on the weekends. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. No, I just, I've always been a workaholic. You know, even when I had my stores, I worked seven days a week, 363 days a year. And that's only because Christmas and Thanksgiving, we had to close. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, there's so many opportunities right now that I just can't pass up. So, right. Yeah. So take you're advantage. Just gonna, yeah. You, you know, strike can. while the iron's I mean, hot. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. So when you say you'll fly your helicopter to LA to the mm -hmm. studio, do you mean the music studio? You know what? I don't know. Um, I want to do a lifestyle show. Okay. Um, think kind of like a Rachel Ask or Martha Stewart. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, like I'll want it to be at a, a studio in LA. So I, I don't want to keep doing shows where I'm traveling a lot. I, I'm already yeah. very burnt out by that, you know, cause I traveled all the time for my stores and then I moved to LA and just for a year and a half, no, not even a year and a half, just like a year for the first time in my entire adult life, I was home every day. You know, I went to my office, I came home, we'd cook, Dewey and I would go hiking. I went to the gym every day. And that was the first time in my entire adult life I had a routine. And I loved it. Mm, syrupy time. Uh, my really Virgo-ness. Uh, I was soul. in such good shape. Yeah. And then I got I cast on Queer Eye. Eye and there's no set schedule. It's funny. We always say that when we're filming, it's actually like being on vacation because at least we're in the same place for four or five days mm. in a row. Mm. Because when we're not, 
You're all we over. We're mm-hmm. all over. We're always on the yeah, go. Yeah, because you don't just film. You you have to do all the press tours and go to all the different countries. Yeah, and season one, two, and one and two especially, a little bit of three, our press tours lasted like two months because, you know, Netflix was, Netflix was amazing with us. They put so much into uh, marketing our show. And I mean, flying us all over the world to do press tours and billboards in Times Square and all over LA. And they really, really put their heart and soul into marketing our show. And I think that was one of the keys to the success of it. Luckily now people know the show, Mm -hmm. you know, so we don't have to go out there and do, you know, weeks of press tours and junkets and shows. And, you know, we do like two days, we hit a couple talk shows and then we go back to filming. But yeah, you know, the, a lot of the boys are on book tours right now. We'll be doing that at some point soon. Um, everybody keeps saying, all the other boys have a book. Why don't you have a book? I'm like, I just launched a furniture line in 16 countries. I launched a new website. I have a whole company that I run. None of the other boys do. They have plenty of time to write a book. <laughs> but you are going to write a book. But oh, they've <laughs> broken me down now. Yeah. And I also, I didn't want to write a biography. Um, I don't feel for me, um, you know, it was the right time for Jonathan, for Tan, for Karamo. Um, Anthony did a cookbook. He didn't do a biography. It wasn't the right time for me. I have a lot of stories to tell from my past. Um, but I'm not ready to tell them. Mm -hmm. Do you want to like wait and then write a memoir? Yeah. You know, God, I'm just getting started. Yeah. You know, but there's also a lot of things (laughs) from my past that could hamper corporate partnerships and, you know, and it's nothing, nothing crazy bad. You know, a lot of things that you would expect from a 15 year old who had to make it on their own and had to do whatever they, it took to make it on their own. Um, but I'm just, I'm not ready to write that. That's not what I want to do. Um, I knew I wanted to do something design related, but I didn't want it to be just a design book. I didn't want it to be a coffee table book. Like, mm-hmm. oh, look at these pretty homes. Eh, you know, and des- a design book is so niche. You know, yes, would fans of mine who weren't necessarily into design buy it because they're fans and our fans are amazing and they'll buy whatever we put out there. Yes. But I also wanted it to appeal to the masses and not just be a pretty design book that sits on the table, a design book that actually could help change your life. Mm -hmm. Um, And I can't, I can't go into what it is, but it's a design book that can help change your life. So it's um, in the works. Awesome. It's yeah, it's in the works. Literally, as of yesterday, we had our first call about the launch of it. So amazing. Yeah. And you also recorded a, a song, a duet yeah. recently. Yeah. Duet. I know you have a passion yeah. for music. Uh, yeah, so I've always I've always loved singing. I was always that kid in leading praise and worship in my church, and I was a lead singer of a Christian rock band back home. Um, I never knew that. Yeah, That's it was amazing. called His Voice. Oh. Um, <laughs> You know, it's always been a passion of mine, but it, you know, it wasn't anything that I was able to pursue. Like I've actually never watched an episode of American Idol because to this day, it breaks my heart that I was never on it. (laughs) (laughs) And so I've never been able to watch it. Any singing competition show. Are you just like mad? It's 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 triggered. It's triggered. You wish you had done it. Yeah. Like I'm like that. I really feel that could have been my life. Like I could have made it. But it just, it wasn't in my cards. And I mean, I like the route I took. It's fine. So yeah, like when I have a little more time, I definitely want to pursue music more. But we are going to hear this duets at some point, right? Oh, wow. Oh. Who was the name of the singer you were My friend Alyssa Cahill. So it is, it's on YouTube as a, a video when we recorded. And then it will be on Spotify and Apple Music in probably mid October. Awesome. Yeah. You're like really putting all kinds of stuff on your resume. <laughs> it's exciting. Got to diversify. <laughs> so let's fast forward to like 80 year old Bobby. Can mm-hmm. you tell me what he might look back on his life and hope he accomplished? I'd like to have kids. More than one kid? I don't know. Kids. I don't know. You know, those like only child children are just crazy. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> straight at me. I, I get it. I'm kidding. You know I love Amelia. She's the quirkiest, cutest little thing in the world. Yeah. She's like a little kid but an adult all at the yeah. same time. Well, that's because she has no I know, age. I know. She spends, all her time with <laughs> spends her time with her quirky mom. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. One or two. No more than two. <laughs> 80 year old me. I don't know. I think I'd, I kind of want to have an empire. You know, Do you, I don't just so want to leave a legacy. of some Yeah, sort. absolutely. You know, I, 
I kind of look at the kind of company I want to build of what Martha's done. You know, Martha's taken something that she was passionate about, design, and she turned it into not only a company that focuses on design, but a multimedia company, you know, with magazines and TV shows and networks and digital. That's, that's where I want to go, including, you know, product lines and brands and maybe retail stores again. I don't want to do them. If, you know, like a company wants to partner with yeah. me to do them, great. I want nothing to do with it. But yeah, I want to, I want to leave a legacy. I want to be, you know, like one of the old grandparents that founded Ferragamo that, you know, are sitting around watching all their kids and grandkids run the company. I think it'd be cute. Cute. Yeah, yeah very, very cute. <laughs> cute. <laughs> well, Bobby, you're just not going to stop changing the world, are you? Mm, hope not. Is there any other projects or anything you want to mention while we've got you about what's coming out? Yeah. My furniture line launches this week. Um, that's with art. With ART. ART. Yeah. It's like 70 something SKUs. It's bedroom, living room, dining, occasional uh, outdoors launching in the spring. Um, it's a really beautiful collection. I wanted it to look and feel and the quality that very expensive, but I wanted it to be attainable to most anybody. You know, it was very important to me because so many people kind of, th- there's very few negative things that are said about Queer Eye. But one of the ones that is said more often than not is, oh, well, yeah, if you had that kind of money, you can make anyone's life better. Um, and so I've always wanted to make sure when it's designing my products that I'm not just designing it for the rich, that you know, almost any fan on the show who wants to make their home better, who wants to make their house somewhere where they can really fully recharge can afford to, um, you know, so like the sofas are a thousand bucks and under, you know, and they they look like they should be five grand. Um, so it's a really beautiful collection. It's simple, it's clean, but with a lot of good detail and it's launching in, in mass retailers like Value City, um, mm-hmm. American Signature Furniture. It'll be on All Modern, Wayfair, um, and that's just the first wave of launch. Um, we couldn't make enough inventory in time because it, we got so many orders that we could do a larger launch right now. So I think there'll be another another round of new big retailers that will be announced in like January, February. Yeah. So do you want to tell our listeners the best place for them to find you, keep track of you, watch yeah, um, you? BobbyBurke.com. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the hub for everything. Yeah. Um, and of course, my Instagram at Bobby Burke, and it's all B-E-R-K. I mean, we're on Twitter as well, but Instagram and the website's the best. Twitter is usually just where I rant about politics. Oh, good. (laughs) (laughs) Got to get it out. For some reason, I think no one can see what I say on Twitter. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening, everyone. To see images of Bobby's work and read the show notes, click the link in the details of this episode on your podcast app or go to cleverpodcast.com where you can also sign up for our newsletter. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. We're also on SoundCloud. So if you're on there, you can find us there too. And if you would do us a favor and go to iTunes and rate and review us, it really helps us spread the word and get our episodes out to more people. And we love it when you find us on social media. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Clever Podcast. We'd love to hear what you thought about this episode, if you have any messages for Bobby, or who you might want to hear from next. Clever is created, produced, and hosted by us, Amy Devers and Jamie Derringer, also known as 2VDE Media, with editing by Rich Straffolino, and music by L1011. Clever is proudly distributed by Design Milk. <laughs>